Thank you for viewing this YouTube archive of a Conscious Consumer Network broadcast. Please feel free to share it far and wide. Check out our weekly broadcast guide for weekly updates on scheduled broadcasts. Help keep us on the air by contributing to our network support fund. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter or get in touch via email. We thank you for supporting free and independent media. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alan Rehart of Crystal Kids TV. I'm broadcasting on the Conscious Consumer Network. I would like to thank the Conscious Consumer Network for allowing me to bring great guests onto their network. I have two websites, www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.crystalkidstv.com. You can go to either of them. Today I have a special guest by the name of Anita Meyer. Anita Meyer has three books. We will be speaking about her two books, In Search of the Holy Language and Beyond the Bible Code. I am going to play the trailer of Anita's book, which is called In Search of the Holy Language.
I would like to introduce Anita to Crystal Kids TV. Hello, Anita. How are you doing? Thank you for coming on to Crystal Kids TV. It is an honor and a pleasure to interview you today. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you for having me as a guest as well. Oh, it's a pleasure. Could you please be so kind to tell us about yourself? How did you become a writer? Well, I wasn't always a writer. Um, mm -hmm. I have a degree in criminology, but I also have an interest in religion. Yes, tell us. And yes. uh -huh. I know it's a big contrast to each other, but I go into the forensic part of religion, and I like to call myself a religious procurement specialist. Mm -hmm. I look for certain very, very hard evidence to find really? clues that venerate a creator. So I was looking for something that connects both the natural world mm -hmm. and religion. And so what I did was to find this piece of evidence is I delved into the Bible. And we know that when we read the Bible, it tells us that when we look to the natural world, that we are able to see our creator or to find our creator. And so what I did was I opened, I took, I looked specifically at the Torah. And I took the very first part of the Torah, which is Genesis 1, the very first verse. Um, which is in the beginning that I created the heaven and the earth. And I took the very first word, which is bar sheet in Hebrew, it means beginning, and I took the very first letter of that word, which is the Hebrew letter B. It's known, known as the Hebrew letter Bet. And right away I was able to see that it has a unit of growth to it. It has a little leg that sticks out on the right-hand side, gets a little bit longer to the left, and then it curves up a little bit longer. So. To test this theory, what I did was I made, I took a bendable wire and I made it in the image of that letter and I took another wire and I spiraled it around that letter with the same exact units of growth that are found in nature. In other words, if that's how small, it's a little bit larger and then a little bit larger. And this we know as, it's, it's known as the Fibonacci sequence. It goes 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 when you have the last two numbers together you get the next number. And in that sequence of numbers, we get 144 and 233. And when you divide those numbers, you get the golden ratio, which is 1.618 or inversely 618. So we, and basically this unit of growth, the Fibonacci sequence, is to simplify it, it's when the next branch on the tree is going to grow. It's that same mathematical unit. And we find this unit, it's, it's permeated throughout all the natural world. It's literally everywhere. It's, it's in all plant growth. It's in the human body, um, the proportions of the human body. We find the Fibonacci sequence in our bone structure, in our finger structure, and in our midsection is the golden ratio. And we see this in all mammals and animals. We see it in insects. We see it in cell division, we see it in DNA, um, we see it in the hurricane, the eye of a hurricane, we see it in the stock market, and it gets even deeper, we see it into the life cycle of an atomic particle. When it, at CERN, the CERN facility, if you're familiar with that, when they smash particles together, when they're studying them to see what happens, um, and to find these particles, they spiral out in the same unit of growth. It's the Fibonacci sequence, which feeds into the golden ratio. And we see that same pattern in the spiral arms of galaxies, and it's even in the distances between the planets. So it's literally everywhere. It's in the micro, and it's in the macro. So with that, realizing this, I wanted to link it to finding strong evidence for a creator. I wanted to find a commonality or a common denominator. Yes. And so I was looking, so, so, I, so what I did was I turned to the Bible and I was looking for one tangible piece of evidence of something that was said to have been given to us, and that was the Ten yes. Commandments that were given to us on Mount Sinai. They were given to Moses. 
And that tells us that, if, you know, if it's this creator that created everything in existence, okay, then those letters must match. Right. Okay. So I was left with this one spiral form, all right, and I started, I made a larger form of it, and I was looking at it, and I started turning it around, looking at it in all different directions. And guess what? I realized that when I looked at one way, it was the Hebrew letter B, that. But when I turned it upside down, it turned into the Hebrew letter T, top. And when I looked at it another way, it turned into the Hebrew letter M, mem. Another way, the letter G, gimel. And I realized that this one form, this form from nature's law, it produces, it produced a complete Hebrew alphabet consisting of 22 letters plus five final letters. Mm -hmm. So it's not only intelligent design, but it's divine design. And so that's the basis of my discovery and the basis of my book, In Search of the Holy Language, and also Beyond the Bible Code. Well, could you please tell us about the books you've written and where can people buy your books? If you want to buy my book, it's available, available in over 200 countries. Um, it's available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and through my publisher, Isotut Publisher. And you can also find more information about my books on my website, which is Anita Meyer Books at Wix.com. Okay, then, please check that out for my audience. And can you please give us an outline on your upcoming book that you're going to have? Yes, I'm writing a new book, yes. if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm, yes. And that book is going, yes, okay. I'm also working on a fourth book, oh. and that one is going to have some spectacular information in there like nobody's ever read before. And um, that book is going to be called Hidden Secrets of Scripture. How interesting. Yes, and it's going to go into not only showing that there's intelligent design in the letters, but, I'm going, but the letters are also based on the science of sound and frequency. Wow, that's so and, interesting. Yes, and so I'm going to reveal in my newest book yes. how the letters themselves, the names of the letters, they have specific names like Allah, Fed, Gimit, Gimel, Dalit, how those letters, when you pronounce the sound of those letters, how they actually produce the letter itself mm -hmm. yeah. and do you, in sound patterns. Right, and do you know when this book is coming out? Uh, I'm working on it, and I hope to have it done in about a couple months. That's very soon. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then it all depends how soon my editor can edit when I'm done writing. So. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So. Well, we can't really predict the future, but it should be coming out very soon, I'm gathering. So, yes. actually, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I know you actually lived in Israel. How was living in Israel, and why did you decide to live there? Well, I went there because I was, I'm very curious about my, about um, the Jewish traditions, and, and I was born Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so I, an opportunity arose for me to go to Israel, and so I went there, and I lived on a kibbutz for about um, a year and a half. And um, there, you know, I, it was a kibbutz that was right down from Mount Gilboa, and um, the biblical Mount, Mount Gilboa. And um, there I worked part of the day, yes. and the other half of the day was we studied and we learned and we learned the language and the traditions. And uh, so then from there, I traveled around Israel, and um, I lived with a woman who was a child of the Holocaust, oh, really? and she taught me the New Testament. So mm -hmm. I consider myself a Messianic Jew now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And actually, can we talk about your book, In Search of a Holy Language? I know you wrote in your book a question that is really asked and always taken for granted. 
Is language a part of our human origin, or is its source something else entirely different and unexpected? Yes, this is a question that has always fascinated me. I was always looking for an answer. Could you please be so kind to give us your yes. opinion? Thank you. Yes. Well, no. Language is endowed to us by our Creator. Because what I just explained with the Hebrew letters, how they are... Yes. They're, 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 they are inherent to nature. When we delve into the oral Torah, and this gets kind of, you can understand better, because in the oral Torah, specifically for this instance, the Kabbalah, it gives us an oral understanding that the Creator used the Hebrew letters to create everything in existence. Okay, He used them like bits of clay to build all the material that we see in our physical world. Um, so, but, and this is the language that the Creator spoke, that He created everything with. It says, you know, when we read in the Bible, it says, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke, and it was a language, and it's based on the science of sound, frequency, and vibration that created all things. So this language is, is not a language that had evolved from cavemen over millions of years. This is a language that was endowed to us. It was given to us by said creator. Mm. And it was given specifically to Moses. Well, it, it goes farther back than that. The patriarch Enoch, um, he was, it's recorded in the ancient book of Jubilees and also in the Old Testament that he was the first scribe in human history. Mm. And it tells mm -hmm. us in that book that he was taken up by God's appointed angel, and he's taught this language and writing. So Enoch was basically, he was, and, and this is the Enoch that is the, the great-grandfather of Noah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so, and, <clears throat> so Enoch was the first to learn this holy writing, and then he passed it down to Noah, and then Noah passed it down to his three sons, and then we find ourselves at the Tower of Babel. And it tells us in the Bible that that they all for all the all Noah's generation, all his children and his descendants, uh, went to the land of Shinar and it tells us specifically that they all spoke one language. Mm -hmm. And this one language was the holy language, which was Hebrew. And they proceeded to build a tower. Yes. And with that tower, they could do. it says that they could do anything that they wanted to. And so I'm perceiving that there's something more to the tower that's not really told to us in the Torah. Possibly there is information about it in the, oral, in the oral text. But I'm perceiving that this tower was a type of antenna. And it had the power to um, transmit frequency. And it had some kind of inherent power over the environment. And it was based off the knowledge of the holy language. And so this had some kind of detriment on the natural world, or, and they were doing something that, that the Creator was, it was, was not in favor of. And so that's why we read that He came down, God came down, and He confused the language, the one language that they all spoke. And that's, so that's how we get all the languages in the world today. Wow, that's, that's great. Uh -huh. And so, then there's a prophecy, there's a future prophecy, and it's found in uh, the book of Zephaniah, and it says that eventually the Creator will restore this pure language. Mm -hmm. So it is not a language that, um, again, that was evolved from cavemen, from simple grunts and coos and... Or, or dots and dashes, or writing on cave walls. This is a language and a writing that was endowed to us. It was specifically and specially given to us by said Creator. Wow. So in your book, In Search of a Holy Language, you actually compare many languages with one word such as cat. Can you please explain this word and how you found similarities to each language? Right. So we find all this writing across the globe today and when we compile all those letters together and we look at them, <clears throat> we see that they all have similarities. 
like all the letter A's found across the globe, they have all similarities. Letter B's have all similarities. And so we can see because, the, and, and not only not only with the writing, but it's also that way with, with the language itself. Right. Words, similar words are very similar in all other languages across the globe. For instance, the word cat. You know, in all languages, it's basically, it sounds the same. English, we say it cat, Arabic, kitty, kuta, Armenian, tatu, um, Bulgarian, kata, and... Chinese, meow, like the sound of meow. Yes. <clears throat> so we have all these similar sounding words. So right. in linguists know that there's a similarity in all the writing and all the languages. And so we can, we can assume that at one time we all spoke one language. Yes, that's... And this I call the primordial language. Mm-hmm. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems as though every language is connected like a family tree. Like, for example, English comes directly from Latin. Latin has links to French and Italian. Everything is connected when it comes to languages. I love to study every language and to see each similarity. Mm -hmm. Right, and the linguists know that, um, well, they say that the oldest writing is Phoenician, Sumerian. And yes. We know that um, Phoenician and Hebrew languages emerged into the Arabic, Greek, Latin, and Roman by way of the Mediterranean Sea, which later separated into Germanic, French, Italian, Spanish, English, and the many other dialects we have today. Yes, yes, and that's what's happened here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in search of a holy language, you wrote, scholars assume that the Sumerian language appears to be the oldest language of a written word. They insert that it is not related to any other known language or writing. Please explain. Right, well, the Sumerian, we see that it's, uh, well, we, it's called cuneiform, cuneiform, mm -hmm. and it's those little dashes that we find in clay and stone. And when we look at those dashes, Actually, what I perceive it to be is they are the, they, they are the Hebrew letters when you turn them sideways to the left. So I'm perceiving that cuneiform was a type of shorthand that they used to write the Hebrew letters because Hebrew letters are curved and it's harder to carve a curved letter into a stone into stone or clay. So they came up with a shorthand and that that's the cuneiform. Right, and actually, I, let's talk about this. I would like to show to my audience a man by the name of Leonardo Grinberg, who designed Hebrew letter artwork. It looks like it is connected to Native American artwork. Anita? Yes, there's a, yes, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of proto, proto Hebrew in uh, Native American writing. And this goes all the way back to the, the, the Native Americans and there's also been DNA, DNA um, studies have been done on the Native Americans, and they find out that um, they have Jewish DNA. And the Native Americans claim that they are from the lost tribe of Manasseh. And so a lot of that writing, they, um, it's used in the Native American, it's used symbolism and also in sound phonics. Right. And they mix a lot of the letters up, but mm -hmm. they're all based on the sound phonics of the Hebrew language. Wow, that's so interesting. How incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, there, yeah, there's, there is a family tree. Like, every language seems to be very connected in many ways. And, and the Hebrew language, for example, is very unique. Let's put it this way. If you go to a synagogue, it's all singing. It's like a different kind of language altogether. Like, it's... Like you were in your book, Beyond the Bible, Code, that all letters of the Hebrew alphabet come from one form that is found within the natural world and exhibits a mathematical framework. Right, so. Yes, and in a lot of, a lot of the songs, mm -hmm. that they, there, there is healing incantations in those songs. And we even find those codes, those, we can find that, that, that mathematical rhythm in the Psalms themselves that were written by King David. Mm, wow. And there's healing tones. There are healing tones in those in the Psalms. And in my new research, I'm going to presenting going to be presenting 
how, in specific, when we pronounce the Hebrew word menorah, mm -hmm. when we sing it, menorah, we actually get the picture of the menorah in a sound wave pattern. Mm, wow. That's it is very amazing. Wow, amazing, yeah. Um, yes, and so at my next conference that I'm going to be at, I have two conferences that are going to be coming up in my, my next one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to uh, have this presentable so that people can see it. Yes. They only see it with their own eyes. Right. And when, and right, and, yeah, and when is this new conference? Uh, I'm either going to present it in May mm -hmm. or in October. Wow, that sounds incredible and very amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. So in, in your book, you wrote, In Search of a Holy Language, Nation itself has a pattern and language of its own, but what you might be astounded to find out is that nature's pattern and language actually matches the pattern of ancient scriptural writing. So it's incredible to hear that nature has its own language because it does in its own way. You know, it's it's really like it's a, like everything in nature has like something to do with math. It seems. So could you please tell us how we see math appearing in nature? Yes. It's um, it's it's in all it's in all things, all things in the natural world. As I was explaining earlier, it's when the next branch on the tree is going to grow. Um, <clears throat> it's in the growth units of the human body. Um, it's in it's in the eye of a hurricane. Um, we we find it in the rows of sunflower seeds. Um, the spirals of a pine cone. Um, it's in all flowers, all plant growth. Um, it's in shells, beautifully, pre beautifully presented in shells. Wow. And in fact, and in fact, the conch shell, if you're familiar with a, what a conch shell looks like, it's a spiral shell. And my spiral pattern matches a conch shell exactly. It has the same mathematical unit of growth, and it has the same pattern. Mm -hmm. Wow. And people can see this illustrated if they go to my website, which is Anita Meyer Books at Wix.com. Yes. Tell us more about the spir spiral. The spiral is found in, in, in both in the natural world. It's found in, which is the macro and the micro. Really? Wow. There's, so there's, many, there, there's many microcosms. So being that it's found in the spiral arms of our galaxy, okay? So everything what's in has to conform to that same pattern. Wow. And so it's not just our galaxy. Yes. When we look out there into the grand cosmos, we see that we see the same spiral pattern in other galaxies. And it's the same mathematical unit that we find in the distances between the planets and stars. And there's even a frequency that we hear from outer space that's based on the golden ratio. Wow, that sounds really incredible. And, and it goes even deeper because our brain, when we are in thought, and the neurons are sparking, yes. what's happening is we are, what's uh -huh. created is, is called a ring wave. And this is the same spiral pattern based off the same mathematical unit that's found in the natural world. And so, in theory, we are actually thinking this holy language. Wow. That's incredible. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. astonishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. So, uh, you worry about it in your book, Beyond the Bible Code, about the significance of number seven and number eight. Please tell my audience about this. Well, seven is always God's number found throughout Scripture. <laughs> okay? Yes. Eight please. goes one beyond that, and a lot of people refer that to the number of Yeshua HaMashiach, which is Jesus the Messiah. Um, but there is a specific code. For instance, when we talk about the codes, 
in my in my book Beyond the Bible Code, I explain how I recap over how all the Hebrew letters come from a single spiral form. Okay, but then I go deeper to show that not only is there intelligence within the letters themselves, but codes can actually be, be found within the Torah. Wow. And specifically in the Torah, mm -hmm. I mean, codes can be found anywhere in any, in any kind of literature, but in the Torah they are found in the exact place that you would find them. There's an intelligent design to it. It's just not random. You find these codes in the story that talks about. For instance, let me, let me give you an example here. Right, please. <clears throat> yes. Like, uh, for instance, um, in Genesis 1, okay, when Genesis 1, 2, 7 through 25, I believe it is, um, and it talks about the tree of life. And it tells us, you know, and God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And then it says, and God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed out of the ground. Okay? And he proceeded, and he grew, and in this garden, he grew, he placed, he placed the man in, the, in this garden, and in the garden grew every type of tree, pleasant for sight, it says, and good for food. Okay, so in that, when it's telling us in that story, in that very section, there are exactly 26 words that we can find of trees and plants that grew in the garden. But it doesn't tell us in the actual text. It tells us and we find this in the code. Like, for instance, um, by every, what's, it's, it's, every, it's called equidistant letter skipping. So you find one letter, okay, and you count, like, say, five mm -hmm. letters from that. And then you get another letter. And then you count five more letters and you get another letter, okay? And so it's a, it's a pattern. It's yes. a reoccurring pattern. And so within that text, we find the word wheat, which in Hebrew is called hita. And we find that, we find that by five letter skips. We find the word the vine. In Hebrew, it's called Jephthah, and we find that by 18 letter skips. We find the word grape, anav, by six. We find chestnut, we find myrtle, we find date palm, we find bramble, pine tree, pistachio, fig tree, willow tree, pomegranate, aloes, tamarisk, oak tree, polar tree, cassia, almond, um, olive, Citron, gopher, and oats. We find all this in that little section of Genesis 2, 7 through 25. And there is nowhere else in the entire Torah that we find this. Amazing. So it is only there. It's to, it's, we find these names of these plants in the story that talks about the garden with plants. Hmm. Yes, and... You wrote in your book, and sit for holy language, for Kabbalists who are attempting to teach geometry shown in the tree of life. Please explain more. Geometry in the tree of life. Yes. Well, there is. A lot of people don't really understand what the, what the tree of life represents. It starts out at the very bottom. Well, it's a geometric structure, but it starts out at the very bottom. It starts out with a triangle shape. Okay? And then it goes into a square. And then it goes into a hexagon, and then a hexahedron. And this, basically, these are the platonic solids, if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. um, there's only five platonic solids, and those are the five platonic solids that we find that construct the tree of life. Mm -hmm. right. And so, I, it is my theory, what it's representing is that the very first one from the bottom, which is a triangle shape, it shows you how energy how, how it manifests in the physical form. Wow. And so it goes through these plato platonic solids, mm -hmm. getting more, more um, precise mm -hmm. and more and more structure to it. So the tetrahedron starts out. It only has three sides to it, but then it, it merges into a, into a square and then from there a hexagon, and then a hexahedron. And so it multiplies. It's kind of like 
-hmm. It's kind of like an embryo that keeps dividing to create a human being. Oh, really? Wow, that sounds really interesting. Uh huh. And in your book, in Sutra Holy Language, you wrote about this. So how can we know for sure that Enoch was the original designer and builder of the Great Pyramid? Why do you think Enoch was the original designer of the Great Pyramid? Right, so Enoch, back to Enoch again, the ancient texts tell us that he was the first scribe in human history, but guess what? It also tells us that he was the first calendar maker. Yes, please tell us more about that. And, and how so is that he built what we know as the henge, just like at Stonehenge. And these are solar lunar calendars. We find them all over the Middle East. Napta Playa has one. Um, Stonehenge, they're mm -hmm. all over. And these were the first calendars. Yes. And they base, they're based off of 365 days. And so, and that's Enoch's number in scripture. Enoch's number is 365. And so, how does he link to the Great Pyramid? Because the Great Pyramid is a henge. It is a 365-day calendar. But now more interestingly is that when we measure the Great Pyramid, we find that all the measurements of the Great Pyramid mm -hmm. from the base, when we do all the, all the mathematical measuring, equates to 365 in every single which way you could possibly imagine. So Enoch's name in that respect is written all over the Great Pyramid. But then it goes a little bit deeper because Egyptologists still to this day cannot, they don't know the answer for why the passageways or the chambers were built in the locations that they were built inside the Great Pyramid. But when I looked at it, I, being a visual pattern recognizer, right away I was able to see that there is a Hebrew letter that is inside the Great Pyramid. It produces a Hebrew letter, ayin. Okay, from the king's chamber down to the queen's chamber and mm -hmm. down the ascending passageway. That pattern produces a perfect Hebrew letter ayin. Now, each one of the Hebrew letters um, have a specific meaning to it. Like the Hebrew letter bet, that means house or tent. The Hebrew letter ayin means an actual I, E Y E. And we know also, too, that masonry came out of Egypt, and so we find a lot of symbolism. For instance, like on the dollar bill, we have the all-seeing, we have the pyramid with the all-seeing eye over it. And I think that the masons were trying to tell us, they brought that information out of Egypt, and they were trying to illustrate to us that the actual eye, the ayin, the Hebrew letter ayin, is actually within the Great Pyramid. And so, now, going back to Enoch, as Enoch was also the first scribe in human history, um, but he incorporated this henge with the Hebrew letter ayin. And the Hebrew letter ayin has, has a specific purpose to it. It puts out, it has a certain sound frequency attached to it. And it was purposely put within the Great Pyramid to resonate a certain frequency. And incidentally, the Great Pyramid is built in the center of all the Earth's land mass. And so when it produced this frequency, it could span out to all the land continents of the Earth. So it could reach all the land continents of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the frequency that the, par that the Great Pyramid puts out today is still the, it puts out the most, the Earth's most beneficial frequency, which is 6.7 hertz. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the Great Pyramid yes. is, uh, it's speaking the holy language. Wow, that sounds incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wrote in your book, in such a holy language, Enoch was known in Egyptian circles as the Phoenix. Please tell yes. us more. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> right. 
Enoch is known as the phoenix. It's a phoenix, a bird. And his name in Hebrew is Hanak, but in Hebrew it's, but in Egyptian, it's referred to as Fahanak. Really? Fahanak. Yes. In Hebrew, if you look in the Torah, his name is known as, as Hanak. Mm-hmm. Or you can say it, Hanak. Okay? And so, um, Egyptians name it, they have the name, his name as the Phoenix. And mm-hmm. that Phoenix has a life cycle, we know it's a mathematical unit, and it has, well, it has a life cycle as we know it, as the myth tells us, every 500 years. The Phoenix, the Phoenix dies, and then it comes back 500 years. And so, yes. there, you know, that, that all fits into the New, Test, the New Testament in, in Scripture. It's kind of linked to all that. And um, there is, and Dina, he was, he was the calendar maker. So he, I have a feeling he knew, he knew the prophecies, the coming prophecies. But it goes, you know, the life cycle, um, it's 500 years. Okay, so this, you know, it's um, in scripture, we have, it tells us, you know, in Matthew 117, this might be kind of complicated a little bit here, but anyways, um, Matthew 117, it tells us, it speaks about 14 generations. And so if we take 14, if we take 500 times 14, we get 7,000 years. And so right now we're in the 6,000 year span. And so when we get to the 7,000 span, that is supposed to be um, the full culmination of, pro- of prophecy. And 7 whether it's 7, 70, 700, or 7,000, the number 7 is still, it's still related to God's number. There's a lot more that goes into Enoch being the phoenix. Um, it also means, in, in Egyptian circles, it means house of the stars. Mm-hmm. And, um, which is also linked to the solar lunar calendar, again, the henge in 365 days on Zodiac. Um, but there is, it gets a lot deeper because yes. the Great Pyramid is aligned with the constellation Orion. Mm-hmm. And there is a pattern that goes around, and it's a spiral pattern. It's the same spiral pattern. And it starts out in Taurus. It goes through Gemini. Canis Minor, Canis Major, it goes to um, Lepis, uh, Iridanus, and then it goes through Orion, the three stars of Orion. And this produces what looks like the spiral pattern, but it's a Hebrew letter. It looks like a letter G, but it's, it's, it's truly a Hebrew letter P, and P means mouth. And I know this is kind of hard to see, but you really have to look at some of the images in my book, or perhaps you can go to my website. Um, but it shows the constellation Iridanus. It's a profile view of a pharaoh, the side view of a pharaoh. We can see the crown. We can see uh, the forehead, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the beard, which is lepus. And so it's my theory, and you can also look in my book to see these miraculous images. What it's representing is this, is, this is where the Egyptians got their dress attire, the crowns of Egypt, mm-hmm. how they, the beard. And it's all based on upper and lower, the crowns of upper and lower Egypt. And it all comes from the image of the stars from above, as above, so below. And so what this is representing is that the pharaoh, which is the constellation Eridanus, it speaks the holy language. And this spiral pattern that goes through those stars is the Hebrew letter P, which means mouth. So what it's saying is the Pharaoh speaks the holy language. I see, yeah. And so that's how the Great Pyramid is connected with the constellation. It's a 365-day calendar. 
and it's connected with the um, precession of these stars, and it's linked in with prophecy, mm, that sounds which is going to be another a future book of mine as well. Mm -hmm. I'll go in deeper depth to explain this. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it will be a really interesting book. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. In your book, Beyond the Bible Code, you wrote in chapter 13 about why do we have a Torah. In that chapter, you wrote the question. We must ask ourselves, why was a Torah given to man? Could you please be so kind to give us your opinion? Yes, that is a very good question. Well, the, some people say that um, the interesting thing about the Torah code, okay, is, again, it's not where you find the words, but where one finds them within the context of where one ex would expect to find them, and conspiring with both the story and with meaningful associated numbers. Okay? But the purpose, the, the purpose of the code, it's not intended to predict the future, okay? Um, but only as a way of realizing that the Torah has everything in it. Mm -hmm. It has everything yes. in it. It's from a divine being who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and present everywhere, as affirmed to in the Bible. So that is the purpose of the Grand Code, is that it is a book, and, it's, and it also tells us in many circles, in, in oral understanding, oral, oral Torah, it explains to us that um, that the Bible is the, that the Torah is the schematics to everything that exists. It's the blueprint, and so therefore it has everything in it. And we have contradicting codes. Like, see, we can find in one part. We can find a code that says uh, a comet's going to hit the Earth, and then we can find another code that says comet will be destroyed. And so these codes have, it's so beautiful that they have both contradictions, the prob there's probabilities. And we don't, we can't, we can't predict the future. We can only find these codes mm -hmm. after the fact. After they've happened, we find them in the Torah text. So that's the beautiful, that's the beautiful thing about it. And, and the thing is, too, that there's all these probabilities. And um, so it's telling us that we really do have choice. Mm -hmm. right. that, that God gave us choice. And we have choice. And we can choose. But that the Torah has all the probabilities of all the choices that we could possibly make. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's how, that's how deep it is. That's how beautiful the message is. It is. It's a really beautiful message. You're right. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Well, could you please tell us what the meaning of a word Torah is? Yes, the word Torah means instruction. Mm hmm and by that meaning, it means that we are to look to it for a guide to teach us how to live this life. And in oral understanding, there is a story that tells us that when uh, Moses was receiving the Torah from God, that the angel in heaven said, why are you giving this divine book to a human? And God told Moses to talk to the angels and tell them why. And Moses said to them, well, do you steal? And the angel said, well, no, we don't, we don't steal in heaven here. He said, do you feel pain? Do you sin? And he said, well, no, we don't sin here. And so all the things that we find that are in the Torah a lot of the commandments, too, um, are solely based for humans. So the angels really had no need for it. So that's why we have the Torah to, as a guide to help us navigate through this thing called life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And...
you, you actually wrote in your book, Beyond the Bible Code, the Hebrew word hanged is in very close proximity to the notorious word Nazi. Please tell us more. Yes, I'd have to look at that code to actually, to actually um, see what that is, but I know it, I, I did a thing on this on my book, and yes, it tells us the word Nazi. We find it in the Torah. Yeah. And we also find in very, very close proximity the word hanged. And mm -hmm. I believe uh, Hitler and the name of the in, the, in the year of the Holocaust. We find this in the Torah text in the Torah code. And we only found this, we couldn't have found it beforehand because we didn't know any of these names or dates. But we find it after the fact. Mm, wow, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Uh-huh. Could you please uh -huh. be so kind to give us your website, Facebook, Twitter, and whichever social media you have? Yes. I have a website. My website is Anita Meyer Books mm -hmm. at Wix.com, and that's spelled A-N-I-T-A-M-E-Y-E-R, Books, B-O-O-K-X, dot Wix, W-I-X, dot com. And then I'm also available. Yes. My books are available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, um, but I have a Facebook, and I'm located under Anita Charlotte Meyer, and then Twitter. Yes. Um, I'm under Anita Meyer Books. Yes. Well, please check that out. Thank you, Anita, for coming on to Crystal Kids TV. It was an honor and pleasure having you, and I hope to have you back in the near future. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Thank you for listening to Crystal Kids TV. I would like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you, Conscious Consumer Network, for giving me a chance to broadcast on your wonderful network. You can check out my websites, www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.crystalkidstv.com for more. You can also like my Facebook page, Crystal Kids Radio, or follow me on Twitter by searching up Crystal Kids TV or on Nally Marie Hart's Google+. See you next week at the same time, same place. Love, peace, and harmony. Love you all. Thank you for tuning into CCN. This unique network is dedicated to free and independent media. CCN was created with the belief that information is the common heritage of all beings, which is why our live stream high definition broadcast is easily accessible and free to view. If we want to change the world, we must first change the media. Having produced over a thousand shows in 2015, which are all archived on YouTube, we look forward to bringing you more groundbreaking, cutting-edge information in 2016. For more information on what is on, please check out our broadcast guide for weekly updates. CCM broadcasts in multiple languages and features some key voices of our challenging times who are all in pursuit of a free, fair, just, sustainable world. CCM belongs to you, the people. And it is up to you all to keep this network on the air. Please contribute to the network support fund or visit the CCN shop. We thank you all for supporting free and independent media.